The Warsaw Pact invasion of Czechoslovakia, officially known as Operation Danube, was a joint invasion of Czechoslovakia by five Warsaw Pact countries, the Soviet Union, Poland, Bulgaria, East Germany and Hungary, on the night of 20–21 August 1968. Approximately 250,000 Warsaw Pact troops attacked Czechoslovakia that night, with Romania and Albania refusing to participate. East German forces, except for a small number of specialists, did not participate in the invasion because they were ordered from Moscow not to cross the Czechoslovak border just hours before the invasion. 137 Czechoslovakian civilians were killed and 500 seriously wounded during the occupation. The invasion successfully stopped Alexander Dubček's Prague Spring liberalization reforms and strengthened the authority of the authoritarian wing within the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia. The foreign policy of the Soviet Union during this era was known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. Topic. Background Topic. Novotny's regime in the late 1950s and early 1960s The process of destalinization in Czechoslovakia had begun under Antonin Novotny in the late 1950s and early 1960s, but had progressed more slowly than in most other states of the Eastern Bloc. Following the lead of Nikita Khrushchev, Novotny proclaimed the completion of socialism, and the new constitution, accordingly, adopted the name Czechoslovak Socialist Republic. The pace of change, however, was sluggish. The rehabilitation of Stalinist era victims, such as those convicted in the Slansky trials, may have been considered as early as 1963, but did not take place until 1967. In the early 1960s, Czechoslovakia underwent an economic downturn. The Soviet model of industrialization applied poorly to Czechoslovakia. Czechoslovakia was already quite industrialized before World War II and the Soviet model mainly took into account less developed economies. Novotny's attempt at restructuring the economy, the 1965 new economic model, spurred increased demand for political reform as well. 1967 Writers' Congress As the strict regime eased its rules, the Union of Czechoslovak Writers cautiously began to air discontent, and in the Union's Gazette, Literary Novini, members suggested that literature should be independent of party doctrine. In June 1967, a small fraction of the Czech Writers' Union sympathized with radical socialists, specifically Ludvík Vakulik, Milan Kundera, Jan Prohazka, Antonin Jaroslav Lím, Pavel Koout and Ivan Klima. A few months later, at a party meeting, it was decided that administrative actions against the writers who openly expressed support of reformation would be taken. Since only a small part of the union held these beliefs, the remaining members were relied upon to discipline their colleagues. Control over literary novini and several other publishing houses was transferred to the Ministry of Culture, and even members of the party who later became major reformers, including Dubček, endorsed these moves. Topic. Prague Spring The Prague Spring Czech, Praske Jaro, Slovak, Praske Jar, was a period of political liberalization in Czechoslovakia during the era of its domination by the Soviet Union after World War II. It began on 5 January 1968, when reformist Alexander Dubček was elected first secretary of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia and continued until 21 August when the Soviet Union and other members of the Warsaw Pact invaded the country to halt the reforms. The Prague Spring reforms were a strong attempt by Dubček to grant additional rights to the citizens of Czechoslovakia in an act of partial decentralization of the economy and democratization. The freedoms granted included a loosening of restrictions on the media, speech and travel. After national discussion of dividing the country into a federation of three republics, Bohemia, Moravia Silesia and Slovakia, Dubček oversaw the decision to split into two, the Czech Republic and Slovak Republic. This was the only formal change that survived the end of Prague Spring, though the relative success of the nonviolent resistance undoubtedly prefigured and facilitated the peaceful transition to liberal democracy with the collapse of Soviet hegemony in 1989. The reforms, especially the decentralization of administrative authority, were not received well by the Soviets, who, after failed negotiations, sent half a million Warsaw Pact troops and tanks to occupy the country. A large wave of emigration swept the nation. 
A spirited nonviolent resistance was mounted throughout the country, involving attempted fraternization, painting over and turning street signs. On one occasion, an entire invasion force from Poland was routed back out of the country after a day's wandering, another force went around in a circle, defiance of various curfews, etc. While the Soviet military had predicted that it would take four days to subdue the country the resistance held out for eight months, and was only circumvented by diplomatic stratagems. There were sporadic acts of violence and several suicides by self-immolation such as that of Jan Palach, but there was no military resistance. Czechoslovakia remained controlled until 1989, when the Velvet Revolution ended pro-Soviet rule peacefully, undoubtedly drawing upon the successes of the nonviolent resistance 20 years earlier. The resistance also became an iconic example of civilian-based defense, which, along with unarmed civilian peacekeeping constitute the two ways that nonviolence can be and occasionally has been applied directly to military or paramilitary threats. After the invasion, Czechoslovakia entered a period of normalization. Subsequent leaders attempted to restore the political and economic values that had prevailed before Dubček gained control of the Kish. Gustav Husak, who replaced Dubček and also became president, reversed almost all of Dubček's reforms. The Prague Spring inspired music and literature such as the work of Václav Havel, Karol Husa, Karol Krill, and Milan Kundera's novel The Unbearable Lightness of Being. <laughs> Brezhnev's government Leonid Brezhnev and the leadership of the Warsaw Pact countries were worried that the unfolding liberalizations in Czechoslovakia, including the ending of censorship and political surveillance by the secret police, would be detrimental to their interests. The first such fear was that Czechoslovakia would defect from the bloc, injuring the Soviet Union's position in a possible war with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization NATO. Not only would the loss result in a lack of strategic depth for the USSR, but it would also mean that it could not tap Czechoslovakia's industrial base in a potential war. Czechoslovak leaders had no intention of leaving the Warsaw Pact, but Moscow felt it could not be certain exactly what Prague's intentions were. Other fears included the spread of liberalization and unrest elsewhere in Eastern Europe. The Warsaw Pact countries feared that if the Prague Spring reforms went unchecked, then those ideals might very well spread to Poland and East Germany, upsetting the status quo there as well. Within the Soviet Union, nationalism in the republics of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Ukraine was already causing problems, and many were worried that events in Prague might exacerbate those problems. According to documents from the Ukrainian archives, compiled by Mark Kramer, KGB chairman Yuri Andropov and Ukrainian leaders Petro Shellist and Nikolai Podgorny were the most vehement proponents of military intervention. The other version says that the initiative for the invasion came originally from Poland as the Polish politician Wladyslaw Gomolka and later his collaborator, East German leader, Walter Ulbricht, pressured Brezhnev to agree on the Warsaw Letter and on ensued military involvement. Vladislaw Gomolka accused Brezhnev for being blind and looking at the situation in Czechoslovakia with too much of emotion. Walter Ulbricht, in turn, insisted upon the necessity to enact military action in Czechoslovakia while Brezhnev was still doubting. Poland's foreign policy on the issue is still unknown. The deliberation that took place in Warsaw meeting, resulted in majority consensus rather than on unanimity. In addition, part of Czechoslovakia bordered Austria and West Germany, which were on the other side of the Iron Curtain. This meant both that foreign agents could potentially slip into Czechoslovakia and into any member of the communist bloc and that defectors could slip out to the West. The final concern emerged directly from the lack of censorship. Writers whose work had been censored in the Soviet Union could simply go to Prague or Bratislava and air their grievances there, circumventing the Soviet Union censorship. Topic: <laughs> Dubček's rise to power. As President Antonin Novotny was losing support, Alexander Dubček, first secretary of the Regional Communist Party of Slovakia, and economist Oda Sik challenged him at a meeting of the Central Committee. Novotny then invited Soviet Premier Leonid Brezhnev to Prague that December, seeking support, but Brezhnev was surprised at the extent of the opposition to Novotny and thus supported his removal as Czechoslovakia's leader. Dubček replaced Novotny as first secretary on 5 January 1968. On the 22nd of March 1968, Novotny resigned his presidency and was replaced by Ludvík Svoboda, who later gave consent to the reforms. Early signs of change were few. 
When the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia Kish Presidium member Joseph Smirkovsky was interviewed in a Rudé Pravo article, entitled, What Lies Ahead? He insisted that Dubček's appointment at the January plenum would further the goals of socialism and maintain the working class nature of the Communist Party. Topic: <laughs> Socialism with a human face. On the 20th anniversary of Czechoslovakia's victorious February, Dubček delivered a speech explaining the need for change following the triumph of socialism. He emphasized the need to enforce the leading role of the party more effectively," and acknowledged that, despite Clement Gottwald's urgings for better relations with society, the party had too often made heavy-handed rulings on trivial issues. Dubček declared the party's mission was, "...to build an advanced socialist society on sound economic foundations a socialism that corresponds to the historical democratic traditions of Czechoslovakia, in accordance with the experience of other communist parties." In April, Dubček launched an «action program» of liberalizations, which included increasing freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and freedom of movement, with economic emphasis on consumer goods and the possibility of a multi-party government. The program was based on the view that socialism cannot mean only liberation of the working people from the domination of exploiting class relations, but must make more provisions for a fuller life of the personality than any bourgeois democracy. Quote, it would limit the power of the secret police and provide for the federalization of the CSSR into two equal nations. The program also covered foreign policy, including both the maintenance of good relations with Western countries and cooperation with the Soviet Union and other Eastern Bloc nations. It spoke of a ten-year transition through which democratic elections would be made possible and a new form of democratic socialism would replace the status quo. Those who drafted the action program were careful not to criticize the actions of the post-war communist regime, only to point out policies that they felt had outlived their usefulness. For instance, the immediate post-war situation had required centralist and directive administrative methods to fight against the remnants of the bourgeoisie, since the antagonistic classes were said to have been defeated with the achievement of socialism, these methods were no longer necessary. Reform was needed, for the Czechoslovak economy to join the scientific technical revolution in the world, rather than relying on Stalinist-era heavy industry, labor power, and raw materials. Furthermore, since internal class conflict had been overcome, workers could now be duly rewarded for their qualifications and technical skills without contravening Marxism-Leninism. The program suggested it was now necessary to ensure important positions were filled by capable, educated socialist expert cadres. In order to compete with capitalism, although it was stipulated that reform must proceed under Kish direction, popular pressure mounted to implement reforms immediately. Radical elements became more vocal, anti-Soviet polemics appeared in the press after the abolishment of censorship was formally confirmed by law of 26 June 1968, the Social Democrats began to form a separate party, and new unaffiliated political clubs were created. Party conservatives urged repressive measures, but Dubček counseled moderation and re-emphasized Kish leadership. At the presidium of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia in April, Dubček announced a political program of socialism with a human face. In May, he announced that the 14th Party Congress would convene in an early session on 9 September. The Congress would incorporate the action program into the party statutes, draft a federalization law, and elect a new central committee. Dubček's reforms guaranteed freedom of the press, and political commentary was allowed for the first time in mainstream media. At the time of the Prague Spring, Czechoslovak exports were declining in competitiveness, and Dubček's reforms planned to solve these troubles by mixing planned and market economies. Within the party, there were varying opinions on how this should proceed, certain economists wished for a more mixed economy while others wanted the economy to remain mostly socialist. 
Dubček continued to stress the importance of economic reform proceeding under Communist Party rule. On 27 June, Ludwig Vakulik, a leading author and journalist, published a manifesto titled The Two Thousand Words. It expressed concern about conservative elements within the Kish and so called foreign forces. Vakulik called on the people to take the initiative in implementing the reform program. Dubček, the Party Presidium, the National Front, and the Cabinet denounced this manifesto. Topic. Publications and media Dubček's relaxation of censorship ushered in a brief period of freedom of speech and the press. The first tangible manifestation of this new policy of openness was the production of the previously hard-line communist weekly literary Novini, renamed Literary Listi, the reduction and later complete abolition of the censorship on 4. March 1968 was one of the most important steps towards the reforms. It was for the first time in Czech history the censorship was abolished and it was probably the only reform fully implemented, albeit only for a short period. From the instrument of parties propaganda media quickly became the instrument of criticism of the regime, freedom of the press also opened the door for the first honest look at Czechoslovakia's past by Czechoslovakia's people. Many of the investigations centered on the country's history under communism, especially in the instance of the Joseph Stalin period. In another television appearance, Goldstucker presented both doctored and undoctored photographs of former communist leaders who had been purged, imprisoned, or executed and thus erased from communist history. The Writers' Union also formed a committee in April 1968, headed by the poet Yaroslav Seifert, to investigate the persecution of writers after the communist takeover in February 1948 and rehabilitate the literary figures into the Union, bookstores and libraries, and the literary world. Discussions on the current state of communism and abstract ideas such as freedom and identity were also becoming more common. Soon, non party publications began appearing, such as the trade union Daily Praise. Labor. This was also helped by the Journalists' Union, which by March 1968 had already convinced the Central Publication Board, the government censor, to allow editors to receive uncensored subscriptions for foreign papers, allowing for a more international dialogue around the news, the press, the radio, and the television also contributed to these discussions by hosting meetings where students and young workers could ask questions of writers such as Goldstucker, Pavel Koout, and Jan Prohaska and political victims such as Joseph Smirkovsky, Zdenek Heisler, and Gustav Husik. Television also broadcast meetings between former political prisoners and the communist leaders from the secret police or prisons where they were held. Most importantly, this new freedom of the press and the introduction of television into the lives of everyday Czechoslovak citizens moved the political dialogue from the intellectual to the popular sphere. Topic. Czechoslovak negotiations with the USSR and other Warsaw Pact states The Soviet leadership at first tried to stop or limit the impact of Dubček's initiatives through a series of negotiations. Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union agreed to bilateral talks to be held in July 1968 at Sierna nad Tisu, near the Slovak-Soviet border, at the meeting, with attendance of Brezhnev, Alexei Kosygin, Nikolai Podgorny, Mikhail Suslov and others on the Soviet side and Dubček, Ludvik Svoboda, Oldrich Cernik, Joseph Smirkovsky and others on the Czechoslovak side, Dubček defended the program of the reformist wing of the Kish while pledging commitment to the Warsaw Pact and Comic-Con. The Kish leadership, however, was divided between vigorous reformers Joseph Smirkovsky, Oldrich Cernik, Joseph Spacek and Frantisek Kriegel who supported Dubček, and conservatives Vasil Bilic, Drahomir Kolder, and Oldrich Sevestka who represented an anti-reformist stance. Brezhnev decided on compromise. The Kish delegates reaffirmed their loyalty to the Warsaw Pact and promised to curb anti-socialist tendencies, prevent the revival of the Czechoslovak Social Democratic Party, and control the press by the re-imposition of a higher level of censorship. In return the USSR agreed to withdraw their troops still stationed in Czechoslovakia since the June 1968 maneuvers and permit the 9 September Party Congress. On 3 August, representatives from the Soviet Union, East Germany, People's Republic of Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Czechoslovakia met in Bratislava and signed the Bratislava Declaration. 
The declaration affirmed unshakable fidelity to Marxism-Leninism and proletarian internationalism and declared an implacable struggle against bourgeois ideology and all anti-socialist forces. The Soviet Union expressed its intention to intervene in a Warsaw Pact country if a bourgeois system, a pluralist system of several political parties representing different factions of the capitalist class, was ever established. After the Bratislava Conference, Soviet troops left Czechoslovak territory but remained along Czechoslovak borders. As these talks proved unsatisfactory, the USSR began to consider a military alternative. The Soviet Union's policy of compelling the socialist governments of its satellite states to subordinate their national interests to those of the Eastern Bloc, through military force if needed, became known as the Brezhnev Doctrine. NATO The United States and NATO largely turned a blind eye to the evolving situation in Czechoslovakia. While the Soviet Union was worried that it might lose an ally, the United States had absolutely no desire to gain it. President Lyndon B. Johnson had already involved the United States in the Vietnam War and was unlikely to be able to drum up support for a potential conflict in Czechoslovakia. Also, he wanted to pursue an arms control treaty with the Soviets, SALT. He needed a willing partner in Moscow in order to reach such an agreement, and he did not wish to potentially risk that treaty for Czechoslovakia. For these reasons, the United States made it clear that it would not intervene on behalf of the Prague Spring, giving the USSR a free hand to do as it pleased. Topic. Invasion and intervention At approximately 11 p.m. on 20 August 1968, Eastern Bloc armies from four Warsaw Pact countries, the Soviet Union, Bulgaria, Poland and Hungary, invaded Czechoslovakia. That night, 250,000 Warsaw Pact troops and 2,000 tanks entered the country. The total number of invading troops eventually reached 500,000. Brezhnev was determined to give the operation a multilateral appearance unlike during the Hungarian Revolution of 1956, but the invasion was dominated by Soviet forces, which outnumbered other troops participating in it roughly five times over. The invading armies were under the direct control of the Soviet High Command at all times. Among them were 28,000 soldiers of the Polish Second Army from the Silesian Military District, commanded by General Florian Sawicki. All invading Hungarian troops were withdrawn by the 31st of October. Romania did not take part in the invasion, nor did Albania, which subsequently withdrew from the Warsaw Pact over the matter. The participation of the German Democratic Republic was cancelled just hours before the invasion. The decision for the non-participation of the East German Army in the invasion was made on short notice by Brezhnev following requests by high-ranking Czechoslovak opponents of Dubček who feared much larger Czechoslovak resistance if German troops were present on Czechoslovak territory, due to previous Czech experience with the German occupation of Czechoslovakia. The invasion was well planned and coordinated, simultaneously with the border crossing by ground forces, a Soviet Airborne Division VDV captured Ruzin International Airport now called Prague Václav Havel Airport in the early hours of the invasion. It began with a special flight from Moscow which carried more than 100 plain clothes agents. They quickly secured the airport and prepared the way for the huge forthcoming airlift, in which an 12 transport aircraft began arriving and unloading Soviet airborne troops equipped with artillery and light tanks. As the operation at the airport continued, columns of tanks and motorized rifle troops headed toward Prague and other major centers, meeting no resistance. During the attack of the Warsaw Pact armies, 137 Czechs and Slovaks were killed and hundreds were wounded. Alexander Dubček called upon his people not to resist. He was arrested and taken to Moscow along with several of his colleagues. Dubček and most of the reformers were returned to Prague on 27 August, and Dubček retained his post as the party's first secretary until he was forced to resign in April 1969 following the Czechoslovak hockey riots. The invasion was followed by a wave of emigration, largely of highly qualified people, unseen before and stopped shortly after estimate, 70,000 immediately, 300,000 in total. Western countries allowed these people to immigrate without complications. Topic. Failure to prepare 
The Dubček regime took no steps to forestall a potential invasion, despite ominous troop movements by the Warsaw Pact. The Czechoslovak leadership believed that the Soviet Union and its allies would not invade, having believed that the summit at Sierna nad Tisu had smoothed out the differences between the two sides. They also believed that any invasion would be too costly, both because of domestic support for the reforms and because the international political outcry would be too significant, especially with the World Communist Conference coming up in November of that year. Czechoslovakia could have raised the costs of such an invasion by drumming up international support or making military preparations such as blocking roads and ramping up security of their airports, but they decided not to, paving the way for the invasion. Topic. Letter of invitation Although on the night of the invasion, the Czechoslovak Presidium declared that Warsaw Pact troops had crossed the border without the knowledge of the CSSR government, the Soviet press printed an unsigned request, allegedly by Czechoslovak party and state leaders, for "...immediate assistance, including assistance with armed forces." At the 14th Kish Party Congress conducted secretly, immediately following the intervention, it was emphasized that no member of the leadership had invited the intervention. At the time, a number of commentators believed the letter was fake or non-existent. In the early 1990s, however, the Russian government gave the new Czechoslovak president, Václav Havel, a copy of a letter of invitation addressed to Soviet authorities and signed by Kish members Bilik, Sevestka, Kolder, Indra, and Kapik. It claimed that right-wing media were fomenting a wave of nationalism and chauvinism, and are provoking an anti-communist and anti-Soviet psychosis. It formally asked the Soviets to lend support and assistance with all means at your disposal to save the Czechoslovak Socialist Republic from the imminent danger of counter-revolution. A 1992 Izvestia article claimed that candidate Presidium member Antonin Kapik gave Leonid Brezhnev a letter at the Soviet Czechoslovak Sierna nad Tisu talks in late July which appealed for fraternal help. A second letter was supposedly delivered by Bilik to Ukrainian party leader Petro Shellist during the August Bratislava conference, in a lavatory rendezvous arranged through the KGB station chief. This letter was signed by the same five as Kapek's letter, mentioned above. Topic. Internal plot Long before the invasion, planning for a coup was undertaken by Indra, Kolder, and Bilik, among others, often at the Soviet embassy and at the party recreation center at Orlik Dam. When these men had managed to convince a majority of the Presidium six of eleven voting members to side with them against Alexander Dubček's reformists, they asked the USSR to launch a military invasion. The USSR leadership was even considering waiting until the 26 August Slovak Party Congress, but the Czechoslovak conspirators specifically requested the night of the 20th. The plan was to unfold as follows. A debate would unfold in response to the Kaspar report on the state of the country, during which conservative members would insist that Dubček present two letters he had received from the USSR, letters which listed promises he had made at the Sierna nad Tisu talks but had failed to keep. Dubček's concealment of such important letters, and his unwillingness to keep his promises would lead to a vote of confidence which the now conservative majority would win, seizing power, and issue a request for Soviet assistance in preventing a counter-revolution. It was this formal request, drafted in Moscow, which was published in Pravda on the 22nd of August without the signatories. All the USSR needed to do was suppress the Czechoslovak military and any violent resistance. With this plan in mind, the 16 to 17 August Soviet Politburo meeting unanimously passed a resolution to provide help to the Communist Party and people of Czechoslovakia through military force. At the 18th of August Warsaw Pact meeting, Brezhnev announced that the intervention would go ahead on the night of the 20th of August and asked for fraternal support, which the national leaders of Bulgaria, East Germany, Hungary, and Poland duly offered. Topic: <laughs> Failure of the plot. The coup, however, did not go according to plan. Kolder intended to review the Kaspar report early in the meeting, but Dubček and Spacek, suspicious of Kolder, adjusted the agenda so the upcoming 14th Party Congress could be covered before any discussion on recent reforms or Kaspar's report. 
Discussion of the Congress dragged on, and before the conspirators had a chance to request a confidence vote, early news of the invasion reached the Presidium. An anonymous warning was transmitted by the Czechoslovak ambassador to Hungary, Jozef Puchik, approximately six hours before Soviet troops crossed the border at midnight. When the news arrived, the solidarity of conservative coalition crumbled. When the Presidium proposed a declaration condemning the invasion, two key members of the conspiracy, Jan Piller and František Barbaric, switched sides to support Dubček. With their help, declaration against the invasion won with a 7-4 majority. Moscow Protocol By the morning of 21 August, Dubček and other prominent reformists had been arrested and were later flown to Moscow. There they were held in secret and interrogated for days. The conservatives asked Svoboda to create an emergency government, but since they had not won a clear majority of support, he refused. Instead, he and Gustav Husak traveled to Moscow on 23 August to insist Dubček and Cernik should be included in a solution to the conflict. After days of negotiations, all members of the Czechoslovak delegation including all the highest-ranked officials President Svoboda, First Secretary Dubček, Prime Minister Cernik and Chairman of the National Assembly Smirkovsky but one František Kriegel accepted the Moscow Protocol and signed their commitment to its 15 points. The protocol demanded the suppression of opposition groups, the full reinstatement of censorship, and the dismissal of specific reformist officials. It did not, however, refer to the situation in the CSSR as counter-revolutionary, nor did it demand a reversal of the post-January course. <laughs> Reactions in Czechoslovakia Popular opposition was expressed in numerous spontaneous acts of nonviolent resistance. In Prague and other cities throughout the Republic, Czechs and Slovaks greeted Warsaw Pact soldiers with arguments and reproaches. Every form of assistance, including the provision of food and water, was denied to the invaders. Signs, placards, and graffiti drawn on walls and pavements denounced the invaders, the Soviet leaders, and suspected collaborationists. Pictures of Dubček and Svoboda appeared in the streets. Citizens gave wrong directions to soldiers and even removed street signs except for those giving the direction back to Moscow. Initially, some civilians tried to argue with the invading troops, but this met with little or no success. After the USSR used photographs of these discussions as proof that the invasion troops were being greeted amicably, secret Czechoslovak broadcasting stations discouraged the practice, reminding the people that pictures are silent. The protests in reaction to the invasion lasted only about seven days. Explanations for the fizzling of these public outbursts mostly center on demoralization of the population, whether from the intimidation of all the enemy troops and tanks or from being abandoned by their leaders. Many Czechoslovaks saw the signing of the Moscow Protocol as treasonous. Another common explanation is that, due to the fact that most of Czech society was middle class, the cost of continued resistance meant giving up a comfortable lifestyle, which was too high a price to pay. The generalized resistance caused the Soviet Union to abandon its original plan to oust the first secretary. Dubček, who had been arrested on the night of 20 August, was taken to Moscow for negotiations. It was agreed that Dubček would remain in office, but he was no longer free to pursue liberalization as he had before the invasion. On 19 January 1969, student Jan Palach set himself on fire in Wenceslas Square in Prague to protest the renewed suppression of free speech. Finally, on 17 April 1969, Dubček was replaced as first secretary by Gustav Husak, and a period of «normalization» began. Pressure from the Soviet Union pushed politicians to either switch loyalties or simply give up. In fact, the very group that voted in Dubček and put the reforms in place were mostly the same people who annulled the program and replaced Dubček with Husak. Husak reversed Dubček's reforms, purged the party of its liberal members, and dismissed the professional and intellectual elites who openly expressed disagreement with the political turnaround from public offices and jobs. Topic. Reactions in other Warsaw Pact countries Topic. Soviet Union On 25 August, at the Red Square, eight protesters carried banners with anti-invasion slogans. 
The demonstrators were arrested and later punished, as the protest was dubbed anti Soviet. One unintended consequence of the invasion was that many within the Soviet state security apparatus and intelligence services were shocked and outraged at the invasion, and several KGB, GRU defectors and spies such as Oleg Gordaevsky, Vasily Mitrokin, and Dmitry Polyakov have pointed out the 1968 invasion as their motivation for cooperating with the Western intelligence agencies. Topic. Poland In the People's Republic of Poland, on 8 September 1968, Richard Sivik immolated himself in Warsaw during a harvest festival at the 10th Anniversary Stadium in protest against the Warsaw Pact's invasion of Czechoslovakia and the totalitarianism of the Stalinist government. Sivik did not survive. Romania A more pronounced effect took place in the Socialist Republic of Romania, which did not take part in the invasion. Nicolae Ceausescu, who was already a staunch opponent of Soviet influence and had previously declared himself on Dubček's side, held a public speech in Bucharest on the day of the invasion, depicting Soviet policies in harsh terms. This response consolidated Romania's independent voice in the next two decades, especially after Ceausescu encouraged the population to take up arms in order to meet any similar maneuver in the country. He received an enthusiastic initial response, with many people, who were by no means communist, willing to enroll in the newly formed paramilitary Patriotic Guards. East Germany In the German Democratic Republic, the invasion aroused discontent mostly among young people who had hoped that Czechoslovakia would pave the way for a more liberal socialism. However, isolated protests were quickly stopped by the Volkspolizei and Stasi. <inaudible> Albania Albania responded in opposite fashion, already feuding with Moscow over suggestions that the country should focus on agriculture to the detriment of industrial development, and concerned that Moscow was becoming too liberal in its dealings with Yugoslavia which, by that time, Albania regarded as a threatening neighbour and had branded in propaganda as «imperialist». It withdrew from the Warsaw Pact entirely. Economic fallout from this move was mitigated somewhat by a strengthening of Albanian relations with the People's Republic of China, which was itself on increasingly strained terms with the Soviet Union. Reactions around the world The night of the invasion, Canada, Denmark, France, Paraguay, the United Kingdom, and the United States all requested a meeting of the United Nations Security Council. That afternoon, the council met to hear the Czechoslovak ambassador Jan Muzik denounce the invasion. Soviet ambassador Jacob Malik insisted the Warsaw Pact actions were those of fraternal assistance against anti-social forces. The next day, several countries suggested a resolution condemning the intervention and calling for immediate withdrawal. U.S. Ambassador George Ball suggested that the kind of fraternal assistance that the Soviet Union is according to Czechoslovakia is exactly the same kind that Kane gave to Abel. Ball accused Soviet delegates of filibustering to put off the vote until the occupation was complete. Malik continued to speak, ranging in topics from U.S. exploitation of Latin America's raw materials to statistics on Czech commodity trading. Eventually, a vote was taken. Ten members supported the motion, Algeria, India, and Pakistan abstained, the USSR with veto power and Hungary opposed it. Canadian delegates immediately introduced another motion asking for a UN representative to travel to Prague and work for the release of the imprisoned Czechoslovak leaders. Malik accused Western countries of hypocrisy, asking, Who drowned the fields, villages, and cities of Vietnam in blood? By 26 August, another vote had not taken place, but a new Czechoslovak representative requested the whole issue be removed from the Security Council's agenda, although the United States insisted at the UN that Warsaw Pact aggression was unjustifiable, its position was compromised by its own actions. Only three years earlier, U.S. delegates to the UN had insisted that the overthrow of the leftist government of the Dominican Republic, as part of Operation Power Pack, was an issue to be worked out by the Organization of American States without UN interference. 
The O's accepted adherence to Marxism-Leninism as an armed attack justifying self-defense by the United States. American involvement in the Vietnam War led UN Secretary General Yu Thant to draw further comparisons, suggesting that, if Russians were bombing and napalming the villages of Czechoslovakia, he might be more vocal in his denunciation. The United States government sent Shirley Temple Black, the famous child movie star, who became a diplomat in later life, to Prague in August 1968 to prepare to become the first United States ambassador to a free Czechoslovakia. Two decades later, when Czechoslovakia became independent in 1989, Temple Black was finally recognized as the first American ambassador to a truly free Czechoslovakia. In Finland, a neutral country under some Soviet political influence at that time, the occupation caused a major scandal. The People's Republic of China objected furiously to the so called Brezhnev Doctrine, which declared the Soviet Union alone had the right to determine what nations were properly communist and could invade those communist nations whose communism did not meet the Kremlin's approval. Mao Zedong saw the Brezhnev Doctrine as the ideological justification for a Soviet invasion of China, and launched a massive propaganda campaign condemning the invasion of Czechoslovakia, despite his own earlier opposition to the Prague Spring. Speaking at a banquet held at the Romanian embassy in Beijing on 23 August 1968, the Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai denounced the Soviet Union for "...fascist politics, great power chauvinism, national egoism and social imperialism." Going on to compare the invasion of Czechoslovakia to the American war in Vietnam and more pointedly to the policies of Adolf Hitler towards Czechoslovakia in 1938–39. Joe ended his speech with a barely veiled call for the people of Czechoslovakia to wage guerrilla war against the Red Army. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Communist parties worldwide. Reactions from communist parties outside the Warsaw Pact were generally split. The Eurocommunist parties of Italy and Spain firmly denounced the occupation, and even the Communist Party of France, which had pleaded for conciliation, expressed its disapproval about the Soviet intervention, thereby publicly criticizing a Soviet action for the first time in its history. The Communist Party of Greece KKE suffered a major split over the internal disputes over the Prague Spring, with the pro-Czech faction breaking ties with the Soviet leadership and founding the Eurocommunist KKE interior. The Eurocommunist leadership of the Communist Party of Finland denounced the invasion as well, thereby however fueling the internal disputes with its pro-Soviet minority faction, which eventually lead to the party's disintegration. Others, including the Portuguese Communist Party, the South African Communist Party and the Communist Party USA, however supported the Soviet position. Christopher Hitchens recapitulized the repercussions of the Prague Spring to Western Communism in 2008. What became clear, however, was that there was no longer something that could be called the World Communist Movement. It was utterly, irretrievably, hopelessly split. The main spring had broken. And the Prague Spring had broken it. <laughs> Normalization 1969 In the history of Czechoslovakia, normalization Czech, normalizes, Slovak, normalizatia, is a name commonly given to the period 1969–87. It was characterized by initial restoration of the conditions prevailing before the reform period led by Alexander Dubček 1963–1968, first of all, the firm rule of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, and subsequent preservation of this new status quo. Normalization is sometimes used in a narrower sense to refer only to the period 1969 to 1971. The official ideology of normalization is sometimes called Husakism after the Czechoslovak leader Gustav Husak. Topic 1969 to 1971, removing the reforms and reformers. When Gustav Husak replaced Alexander Dubček as leader of the Kish in April 1969 after the military intervention of Warsaw Pact armies, his regime acted quickly to «normalize» the country's political situation. The chief objectives of Husak's normalization were the restoration of firm party rule and the re-establishment of Czechoslovakia's status as a committed member of the socialist bloc. The normalization process involved five interrelated steps. 
Consolidate the Husak leadership and remove reformers from leadership positions. Revoke or modify the laws enacted by the reform movement. Re establish centralized control over the economy. Reinstate the power of police authorities, and expand Czechoslovakia's ties with other socialist nations. Within a week of assuming power, Husak began to consolidate his leadership by ordering extensive purges of reformists still occupying key positions in the mass media, judiciary, social and mass organizations, lower party organs, and, finally, the highest levels of the Kish. In the fall of 1969, 29 liberals on the Central Committee of the Kish were replaced by conservatives. Among the liberals ousted was Dubček, who was dropped from the Presidium the following year Dubček was expelled from the party, he subsequently became a minor functionary in Slovakia, where he still lived in 1987. Husik also consolidated his leadership by appointing potential rivals to the new government positions created as a result of the 1968 Constitutional Law of Federation which created the Czech Socialist Republic and the Slovak Socialist Republic. Once it had consolidated power, the regime moved quickly to implement other normalization policies. In the two years following the invasion, the new leadership revoked some reformist laws such as the National Front Act and the Press Act and simply did not enforce others. It returned economic enterprises, which had been given substantial independence during the Prague Spring, to centralized control through contracts based on central planning and production quotas. It reinstated extreme police control, a step that was reflected in the harsh treatment of demonstrators marking the first anniversary of the August intervention. Finally, Husik stabilized Czechoslovakia's relations with its allies by arranging frequent intrabloc exchanges and visits and redirecting Czechoslovakia's foreign economic ties toward greater involvement with socialist nations. By May 1971, Husak could report to the delegates attending the officially sanctioned 14th Party Congress that the process of normalization had been completed satisfactorily and that Czechoslovakia was ready to proceed toward higher forms of socialism. <laughs> Later reactions and revisionism The first government to offer an apology was Hungary, on the 11th of August 1989. The Hungarian Socialist Workers' Party publicly published its opinion on the fundamentally wrong decision to invade Czechoslovakia. The House of the National Assembly of Poland in 1989, on the 21st anniversary of military intervention, adopted a resolution condemning the armed intervention. Another apology was issued by the People's Assembly of East Germany on 1 December 1989, where they apologized to the Czechoslovak people for their involvement in the military intervention. An apology from Bulgaria came on the 2nd of December 1989. On the 4th of December 1989, Mikhail Gorbachev and other Warsaw Pact leaders drafted a statement calling the 1968 invasion a mistake. The statement, carried by the Soviet news agency TASS, said that sending in troops constituted interference in the internal affairs of a sovereign Czechoslovakia and must be condemned. The Soviet government also said that the 1968 action was an unbalanced, inadequate approach, an interference in the affairs of a friendly country." This acknowledgement likely helped to encourage the popular revolutions that overthrew communist regimes in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Poland, and Romania at the end of 1989 by providing assurance that no similar Soviet intervention would be repeated were such uprisings to occur. The invasion was also condemned by the newly appointed Russian President Boris Yeltsin. We condemn it as an aggression, as an attack on a sovereign, stand-up state as interference in its internal affairs." During a state visit to Prague, on 1 March 2006, also Vladimir Putin said that the Russian Federation bore moral responsibility for the invasion, referring to his predecessor Boris Yeltsin's description of 1968 as an act of aggression. When President Yeltsin visited the Czech Republic in 1993 he was not speaking just for himself, he was speaking for the Russian Federation and for the Russian people. Today, not only do we respect all agreements signed previously, we also share all the evaluations that were made at the beginning of the 1990s. I must tell you with absolute frankness, we do not, of course, bear any legal responsibility. But the moral responsibility is there, of course. On the 23rd of May 2015, Russian state channel Russia One aired Warsaw Pact: Declassified Pages, a documentary that presented the invasion as a protective measure against a NATO coup. 
Slovakia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated that the film attempts to rewrite history and to falsify historical truths about such a dark chapter of our history. František Sabej, the Slovak chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the National Council, stated that they describe it as brotherly help aimed to prevent an invasion by NATO and fascism. Such Russian propaganda is hostile toward freedom and democracy, and also to us. Czech President Milos Zeman stated that, Russian TV lies, and no other comment that this is just a journalistic lie, cannot be said. Czech Foreign Minister Lubomir Zoralek said that the film, grossly distorts the facts. Russian ambassador to the Czech Republic, Sergei Kisilyov, has distanced himself from the film and stated that the documentary does not express the official position of the Russian government. One of the most popular Russian journals, Gazeta.ru, has described the document as biased and revisionist, which harms Russia. Topic see also History of Czechoslovakia 1948 Oda Sik Prague Spring Topic References Topic Further reading Bischoff, Gunter, et al., eds. The Prague Spring and the Warsaw Pact Invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968 Lexington Books, 2010 510 pp. ISBN 978-0-7391-4304-9. Suvorov, Victor, The Liberators Hamish Hamilton, 1981. ISBN 0-241-10675-3. Williams, Kieran, Civil Resistance in Czechoslovakia, From Soviet Invasion to Velvet Revolution, 1968-89, in Adam Roberts and Timothy Garton Ash eds, Civil Resistance and Power Politics, The Experience of Nonviolent Action from Gandhi to the Present Oxford and New York, Oxford University Press, 2009, pp. 110-26. ISBN 978-0-19-955201-6. Windsor, Philip, and Adam Roberts, Czechoslovakia 1968, Reform, Repression and Resistance London, Chateau and Windus, and New York, Columbia University Press, 1969, 200 pp. Topic external links Soviet Invasion of Czechoslovakia, Collection of Archival Documents on www. Digital Archive. Org. Project 1968–1969, page dedicated to documenting the invasion, created by the Totalitarian Regime Study Institute. The short film Russian Invasion of Czechoslovakia 1968 is available for free download at the Internet Archive. The short film Warsaw Pact Invasion of Czechoslovakia 1968 is available for free download at the Internet Archive.